All right, good evening. This is a Wednesday night Bible study. We have a couple of new faces here, which is always nice to see. We have uh, we have like 70-something in the group, and we vary from two <laughs> to maybe 25, or really, I think the most you've had is like 30, and that may have been that night that Todd brought his entire old football team here, but uh, that was a good time. So we have been, uh, we've been studying in this Bible study now for, man, it's been probably six or seven years that we've been doing this on Wednesday night, and you know the purpose of Bible study is... Uh, for what we consider the term edification. It's kind of like going to school. You know, the purpose of it is to understand more about what the Bible contains. Uh, it is, as most many know, it's the best-selling book year after year after year after year, and there's a reason for it. But what's really funny is because it's the best-selling book year after year after year doesn't necessarily mean people actually read it, right? So you could have the best-selling book, but just because it's sold doesn't mean it's read. And so further, just because it might be sold and, and people might read it, there's, it's such a big book, it's not just a, you know, like a, a, a start to finish, right? You don't start in Genesis and end in Revelation and be like, oh, wow, this is a really, this is a really good book. It made a whole lot of sense because if you read Genesis Revelation, it's not in chronological order, number one. And, and then in number two, there's a lot of confusion because uh, the, the, there are actually 66 books located in the Bible. So a lot of people probably don't know that. There are 66 books in here? Yeah, there's 66 of them. And so when you read through the 66, you go, well, where should I start? Where would I begin in reading these 66 books? Anybody have any idea where you would want to begin? Well, most books you start where? You start at the beginning, right? Well, if you start at the beginning here, you'd learn about the creation of the world and uh, you learn about the creation of man and, and those things. But uh, you probably get a little ways further and say, uh, I don't know, this is kind of historical and kind of boring and there's a lot of lineages and stuff. Uh, what most people are looking for in the Bible is application, right? They're looking to take the Bible and then apply it to their lives in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm sure most of us have been in a household that has a, a plaque on the wall or a little Bible verse here and there. And, and what is that Bible verse? Usually it's a, it's a little trite phrase. It's a little saying. It's something like, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Or something like that. And you go, well, what is that? Where did that come from, right? Uh, to know wisdom is to know God. Okay, well, where did that come from? What, how, what does that mean? And so it's kind of like you take little bits and pieces of the Bible, and that's what most people have an understanding of the Scriptures about. They have a, they have a very, um, uh, not a, even a large overview. They just have little bits of, of phrases, and they can tell you verses here and there maybe, but if you said, hey, where is that at? And what's the context behind it? You know, if you looked and, and said, well, where is, for, is for me and my house we will serve the Lord, where is that at? Anybody know? Joshua, yes. So, I mean, yes, yeah, so you have a, who, who is Joshua, you know? He took over from who? From Moses. Well, who's Moses? And all of a sudden, you start having all these people. So, what we have on this chart up here is a, what I would consider to be the 30,000 foot view. It's the overview of something. If you walked in and you said, okay, today's my first day of college, and you walk into college and, and they say, uh, you know, what, what is your major? And you're like, well, I'm an engineering student. Sweet. Sit down for quantum physics. And you'd be like, well, what? Yeah, that's your first class, quantum physics. And you walk in the door and you sit down in the quantum physics class and the professor starts saying things, all of which is truth, all of which is very important and very relevant, but to you it makes absolutely no sense. You're like, well, what is this? I don't, I don't understand. This is really dumb. And it's not because that the material is bad, right? The material is not bad. It's that you don't understand it, right? And so the understanding of the scriptures is laid out in a way in which... God's desire is for men to understand the Bible. He doesn't want people just to read it and be like, oh, that was a cool phrase, or let me grab a little devotional and read you know, 12 verses or four verses and say, all right, now how can I figure out how to put this into my life? So the phrase that we use a lot of times is to say, look, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, it is God breathed, meaning that men wrote the scripture with their hands, but it is the word of God penned by man. And so when you look at the scripture as a whole, we want to break it up into uh, divisions or break it up into sections to make it more understandable. And so what this is, is that big overview. It's kind of saying, okay, who are these major players? I mean, if we ask some of these people's names, so for example, Adam, you know, I'll think everybody knows who Adam and Eve is, right? Everybody's heard that. Okay. How about Abraham? Well, yeah. Okay. The Jews, we kind of know a little bit about Father Abraham or whatnot, right? Moses, okay, most people have seen Charles and Heston, the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, uh, David, okay, yeah, we've heard about him, David and Goliath, and that type of thing, right? So you, you kind of know little bits and pieces if you've gone to Sunday school or whatnot, but these men, these are big figures and big points, and of course, this is not all-encompassing of the entire Bible. It, it is, it is a, a big 30,000-foot view 
of major events, and then you can filter in the details with it. So uh, the big thing to understand is that from the very beginning of the Bible, it's God's desire, okay, in all of the scriptures that his will be accomplished. And his will is accomplished through men. And so we'll look at that a little bit today and how that works in terms of what Christ has done. But our study has been lately, uh, I gave the guys a choice and said, hey, what, what, what do you guys want to study? And they said, well, uh, you know, kind of gave them a couple different books. And we study through books, typically not usually topics. We do topics every once in a while, but we do do books, you know, most often. And so I say we can study the book of Romans, study the book of Galatians. And so then, uh, you know, I think we actually ended up picking the book of Matthew, which we have been in. And we're reading it from a very different perspective than most people would. See, when we read the scriptures, we don't open it up and just magically pick a verse and say, okay, let's go in and do this. Because that doesn't really make any sense. Here's, here's the best example I can give you. All of the Word of God is an accurate uh, recordation or accurate record of truth about historical events that occurred, some of which are applicable to you today, living today. Some of them are actually instruction given to you. Others are not instruction given to you that you wouldn't do. So here's an example. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that the Word isn't truth. It's just not truth for you. It's not truth given directly to you. Uh, being in the legal field, uh, I, I know a decent amount about the law. And if I uh, was a criminal defense attorney and I had a client come into me and say, look, dude, I'm in trouble. And I say, what's your problem? I'm a lawyer. I know all about the law. Tell me about what your problem is. And he says, well, I'm being charged with murder. I'm like, murder? Really? He's like, yeah, it's really not going to be good. You know, I got to go in. I, I, I skipped my bail. And first it was going to be manslaughter. Now they're saying it's murder. And uh, I tell him, I say, look, you're in luck. I'm a criminal defense attorney. That's what I do. I defend, I defend murderers. And you're like, really? Are, are, are you, do you think you can get me off? He goes, yeah, no problem. I'm sure I can. He goes, okay, because I think what I do is self-defense. He goes, no problem. Let's, let, we'll, we'll take care of you. And okay, the guy's kind of relieved. He goes, yeah, well, that's, that sounds really good. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit better now about the situation, right? And so, you know, the, the, the first hearing date comes. And, uh, uh, you know, the guy's a little bit nervous. The defense is a little nervous. And he asks the lawyer, he asks me, he says, hey, are, are we good? I said, yeah, don't worry about it. We're fine. He goes, okay, I got this. Okay, 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 you just, you just sit there. And so the, uh, the judge says, all right, I understand we have some pretrial motions that are going to be uh, heard today. Uh, uh, you know, uh, defense, you want to go ahead and, and bring that motion forward? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem, Your Honor. Uh, uh, if, uh, I, I, I'll give you my copies of my motions here. And if you'll turn to uh, Florida Statute uh, 322, uh, Section 4, B3D9E4, it says the defendant shall be found not guilty. And then I sit down, right? Be quiet and silence in the courtroom. Everybody would look at you like you're an absolute idiot. The, the, the prosecutor would probably be like, is this guy serious right now? Judge goes, uh, counsel, would you like to go ahead and proceed with your argument? And I said, yeah, that's my argument. The law says right there, the defendant shall be found not guilty. Yep, there it is. The judge says, uh, approach the bench, please, right now. I say, what's going on? Defendant says, what's going on? What's going on? Hey, dude, I got this. He walks up there and he says, yeah, it says the defendant should be found like here. Counsel, are you an idiot? No, the law says right here, the defendant shall be found not guilty. He says, did you read what came before that? And he goes, uh, yeah, but it says right, yeah, no, did you read what came before that? And he goes, yeah. Prosecutor's looking at him like, this guy's an idiot, right? And the judge says, you have to read what comes before it. You have to understand the context of that phrase. And right there it says the defendant shall be found not guilty is only when, what does it say before that? The state has not proved beyond a reasonable doubt, do, 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 and goes on the rest and gives the corpus and the body of the offense and it does not meet the burden. And So that hasn't happened. You're just taking one piece out of it. Yeah, but that's what it says. Do you understand why context is so important? Context is what the scripture is all about. And most people, I will be very clear in saying that most people who, who, uh, who are Christians uh, know very little about the Bible. They really do. They know very little about where the scripture comes from. They know very little about, you know, well, who is Jesus Christ? Uh, what is he? Why did he come? Who is Israel? What is the church? What is the body of Christ? What is the Holy Spirit? Where is Nazareth? What is Galilee? Who is Moses? What is the law for? All of these questions that, you know, very easily, I understand why people's faith varies because they have no contextual understanding of the Bible. They live their lives by looking at little phrases in the bathroom. I mean, 
don't get me wrong, if you go to my bathroom, I probably have a little butterfly ornament that my mom got me that has a Bible verse on it, right? It, she went to the Christian bookstore, she bought a Bible verse plaque, and it's in there. I think there's two right there. Are there two right there? Are there two with Bible verses on them right there? Yeah, I didn't buy those, by the way. Somebody gave me those, and if I don't put them in my house, somebody's going to get mad. Hope my mom doesn't listen to this, because she probably gave them to me. But either way, the context of the scripture is really, 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 I can't stress enough, it's really important. And when you don't understand the context of the scripture, you know what happens? You actually take God and what he says in his word, and you make him a liar, because he's not saying that, right? What God says is his word in context, nothing more, nothing less. So the question becomes, well, how do we understand context, right? Well, let's, let's look at a couple verses. Let me give you a verse. If you look at the book of 2 Timothy, <clears throat> Of all of the people who wrote the scripture, of all the people that wrote the scripture, who wrote the most? Anybody know? A guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus. He wrote the most. You're probably like, really? He wrote the most? Yeah. He wrote 13 books of the Bible. Wow. 13 of them. And of those 13, those are all located in what's proverbially called the, the New Testament. Okay? That's where most people get their Bible verses from. If I told you to turn to uh, you know, Nahum or Habakkuk, you'd probably be like, oh, what, where, where is that now? What is Nahum? There's a book called Habakkuk? What is Habakkuk? You know? I, like, I like our pastor's joke. He always says, yeah, so when you get to heaven and uh, you, you meet Habakkuk, he goes, hey, I'm Habakkuk. Have you read my, <laughs> have you read my book? And the guy's going to be like, Habakkuk? I didn't even know there was Habakkuk in the Bible, right? It's pretty funny, but it's true. You know, most people don't know what that is. And, and, and I understand, you, you may not, this may be the first time even being uh, used to looking at the scripture, but look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and I want to show you an example of this and what happens when people don't take the scripture and apply it in context, okay? So 2 Timothy chapter number 2, if you read down in verse number, uh, verse number uh, look at verse number 14. He says, <clears throat> of these things, put them in remembrance, <clears throat> excuse me, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers, okay? So what he says is strive about words to no profit. I and mean, we can sit there and, and bicker about words and try to figure out what words mean. Words mean what they mean, right? That people will call the term semantics, right? You ever heard that word? Oh, if somebody's being, you're, oh man, this is just semantics here. You're playing word games with me, right? So let's look at what he says here in verse 15. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Has anybody ever taken a test and not studied for it? Yes, sure. The end result is usually, unless you're just really good at that subject matter, typically is not going to be positive. Usually going to do worse. If you study, you do what? You do better. Now, if you show up to class and you haven't studied... And I'll give you the example. One of my favorite ones is uh, when I was in school, we had a professor in a class called Sales, Leases, and Licenses, and she was, I mean, she was scary. I mean, she had white hair. She was an older lady. She wore purple all the time. And she was, a, she was kind of a mean lady. And one of the examples, uh, one of the times when the classes, we have these examples that we're supposed to work through, like these, this homework. And the teacher goes to uh, all of us and says, you know, okay, we're going to go down this list. We have, you guys have numbers. It's all going to be random. I'm just going to pick a number. If that's your number, you're on call for the day, you know, for half the class. And you have to work through these problems. And you better have done them beforehand. She says, now I'm going to give, I can give you a pass. If you don't work the homework beforehand, you have, you know, two passes a semester. So if you need a pass, you need to come up to me before, say, I didn't have a chance to do the homework. I'll let you have two passes. But if you waste our time and the class's time, I take, you know, whatever, one point off your grade or 1.75 off your grade. That's a big deal when you're talking about a 4.0 scale and you all of a sudden you lose a point, you're at a 3.0 and nobody's really going to get a 3.0 anyways or 4.0 anyways. So if you get a three, automatically get a two and that's, that's not good. And so I remember sitting in class and she goes, you know, you know, 27 and I'm like, oh sweet, I'm 25, you know, like I'm, I'm shaking and they get this girl and she starts going and the professor is asking her these questions and you can tell, I mean, right from the beginning, she did not do the homework and the professor's kind of working through her because maybe she's just not as quick as some of the other people and Professor says, you know, I have to ask you a question. Did, did, you, did you study this stuff out and do the homework? And she's like, no. And the professor says, I'm going to have to take 0.75 off your grade. The chick got so red. Her ears were beet red. I mean, I think she almost was crying. I mean, she was just sitting there like this. 
And then she called on my buddy right next to me after that. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to throw up right now. Because you lose that type of grade, a GPA is everything. But, but you can see here in this verse, that studying issue says, study to show yourself approved unto God. That means that you understand what God's doing. You understand what God does. <clears throat> You're not walking around going like, <clears throat> I think this is what God is saying. <clears throat> no. He says a workman. That is that you're actually doing the work of studying. You're, you're, being, you're being diligent in your study, right? He says a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So if you don't do the work, what's going to happen? You don't do your study and you're going to be ashamed because you don't really know what to talk about. So as being a Christian, I can tell you that before I really took Bible study seriously and I actually spent some time, you know, reading through the scriptures, going over it and over it and over it. If somebody asked me a question, my typical answer would be like, oh, it's in here somewhere, you know. Okay, what does that do? I mean, it's in there somewhere. What do you mean? How do you know it's in there somewhere? Because somebody told me? Okay, well, how do you know they weren't lying? Good point. I don't really know. And then I walk away going, well, I didn't give this guy any answers, you know? Uh, and so you, you want to be a workman that needs not to be ashamed because the shame comes from not studying, not understanding what the Bible is. And so he gives you the way of doing it. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. There's no need for you to be ashamed. I mean, you have the Bible. You have the ability to study. You have, you can be a workman. And he says, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. And this is a very weird word because many people don't know what this means. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And he gives you an example of what that means right next in the passage, okay? We're always looking at the context here. So Paul is writing this to, to a guy named Timothy, and Timothy is a pastor, and he's also a leader of a church, and he's one of Paul's really good friends. And he's writing this and telling him what he should do. And he says, rightly dividing the word of truth. And he says, see, there's this word of truth called the scripture. And he goes, you need to rightly divide it. That is to place it into its proper context. That's what right division is, rightly dividing the word of truth. So look what he says in verse 16. He says, but shun profane and vain babblings. Those are the guys who, that, that's like that girl who didn't study, and she sat there and she goes like, oh yeah, and uh, the, this means this, and the professor's kind of working through it. Everybody in the class is like, is this girl really that dumb? I mean, did you look at this at all? And this means this, I mean, it was like 30 minutes. I kid you not, the girl went for like 30 minutes just, and that's what I think made the professor so mad. If she probably would have said, you know what, professor, I, I had a late night, I didn't get stuff, I meant to tell you at the beginning, I didn't. She probably would have said, you know what, that's okay. I, I let you pass. But that was, she made a, she made a, you know, an example. He says, but shun profane and vain babblings. You know what vain means? It comes from the word vanity. You know what vanity is? Vanity means there's, there's no profit in it. It's just, it's just, it's just vain, right? Vain babblings. So meaning your mouth is moving. I, I, I hear words coming out, but they don't make any sense and they're not profiting anything. Look what he says. In doing so, remember I told you before that the whole purpose of God's word is that you understand God's will. And not only that you understand God's will, but that you understand who God is. He says, when you do that, when you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're not a workman that, that is not studying. He says, you'll, you'll, you'll speak profane and vain babblings and you'll increase. He says, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. That is, they'll create heresies. I mean, how do you think that we have about 26,000 Christian denominations? And if you think I'm kidding, I'm really not. I mean, go on Wikipedia tonight and type in Christian religion. And then look, at there's 26,000 of them. Well, how is there 26,000? I mean, really, how is it even possible? I mean, if I started naming them right now, I could probably give you like 50. And that's even going to like, you know, uh, Greek Orthodox and like talking about all kinds of, you know, uh, Coptic Christian, you know, like just all these weird ones that I've kind of studied over the years. But why is there 26,000 of them? And what's really weird is that if I went to the church up the street that calls themselves Christians, they would say something down the then different than the guy down the street over here that calls themselves Christians. And this guy over here would say something different than this guy says, and he's a Christian. So how do we know what the truth is? The problem is that they don't ever come back to the Bible. They use the Bible in bits and pieces, right? They'll take little verses out of context, but they don't get the bigger picture. They don't actually see the contextual understanding of the word of God. Look what he reads in here in verse number 17. He says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. He actually names two guys. He says, These guys are the ones that are doing it. They're out there spitting this nonsense, and it's not profiting anybody. And he actually says what they're preaching. He says in verse 18, he says this, Who concerning the truth have erred. <clears throat> Meaning they think they're out there preaching. They think they're actually doing the work of God, but they've erred concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection, that is the resurrection of the dead, is past already. And as a result, he's saying, look, there's no more resurrection. Christ died. There's no resurrection. It's all over. And all these people are going, what? I thought the whole purpose of the resurrection is that we have life now, right? 
He says they profess uh, that they know God, they have no clue, right? Of Hymenaeus and Philetus, they overthrow the faith, and as a result, that's what it is. So, you know, what I want to explain to you guys is, you know, this bigger picture of understanding the scripture starts with the first and foremost understanding about what God says about humanity, right? That's something that a lot of people don't like. Look at the book of Ecclesiastes for me. Look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, probably a book you've never looked at. Can anybody say that they have looked at Ecclesiastes before? Anybody? Maybe one or two? Maybe. It's a, it's a book that many people don't really look at. So the writer of the Ecclesiastes is uh, uh, Solomon, and Solomon is the son of David, as we saw up there. And so Solomon is always considered to be, many consider him to be, the wisest man that ever was, right? Uh, if anybody know what Reddit is, I'm sure some of you guys know what Reddit is. Yes, no, maybe so. There was a post the other day about uh, about Reddit, and uh, it was one of the. I'm, I'm going to geek out here for a second, but somebody will find this in particular, probably on YouTube. Somebody will say, "Oh, that's really good." But there's memes. You know what memes are? Yes. There's little memes, like a little advice animals, and it says, uh, you know, uh, basically it was talking about heaping coals of fire on their head. When somebody does something mean to you, you turn around and do something nice to them. You do something, and the guy posts and he says, whenever my coworkers are really mean to me and talk bad about me, I just do really nice things like buy them flowers and then get them chocolate so that everybody in the office thinks they're really, you know, they're, they're really the bad guy, even though I messed up. And I thought that was kind of funny. He says, we reap, you know, heaping coals of fire over their head. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm talking about in this, in this uh, proverb is that those people on Reddit were saying, man, that was a really good proverb like that's where did that come from and somebody goes is that a chinese proverb and, and the guy's like no no no, that's that's the bible that's actually found and they and they quoted some of the scriptures uh, on it it was actually in in the, in the book of matthew it's quite one of christ's words but it's also found in, in proverbs as well so in ecclesiastes it's a really good book okay i would tell i would tell everybody that ecclesiastes is a book to read if you have any desire to become a millionaire or a billionaire read that book because it's going to teach you that Solomon, the richest dude that ever was, I mean, this guy had so much money. I want to tell you what he writes here. Look at this. <clears throat> Look at verse number, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 4. There's so many good. He goes, one generation, uh, uh, actually, let's just start at ver chapter 1, verse 1. He says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities. We just saw that word vanity. What does that mean? Vain. He's like, it's just vain. It's, it's pointless. There's no value in it. It's worthless. It's profitless. He says, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All is vanity? And he goes on to say, what profit hath the man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? He goes on to say, one generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. You know, I, I always feel this way whenever I go out fishing and it's like, you know, 10, 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night, we're fishing for snook on a dock and you're going through these neighborhoods and you're just seeing into everybody's house, you know? You're seeing into everybody's house and they're all doing the same thing. They're either sleeping or they're sitting in front of their TV watching TV, you know? And I just think to myself, I'm like, that's the life. That's what everybody wants to do. They want to come home and sleep or watch TV. You know, it's like we go to work all day, we make that money, and then what happens? You got to give that money back to somebody else, right? I was joking and I said, you know, really, I'm just a redistributor of money. That's all I really do. You know, like my, my lawn guy, right? I got I to gotta, I gotta pay my lawn guy, right? But my lawn guy, he got in trouble. He got a DUI. So he had to go to one of the lawyers I work with, and because he had to go to one of the lawyers, he paid him the money. And so eventually that lawyer who I work for had to pay me. So basically we could just skipped all this and I could just pay, the long, the long guy could just paid me. But you see, we just kind of just keep passing the money out and that buck, that dollar just goes around just a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. And it just, you start to realize, wow, there's a, futil there's a futility in this. There's some vanity that is in this. And so you go, wow, this is kind of depressive, Jason. I don't know if I want to learn more about this. Well, yeah, the better, you, the more you understand the carnal nature of things and the understanding of how the world works, yeah, it is a little bit depressive, but there's really good news, and I'm going to share that. Look what he says here. Verse number seven. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. 
He says everything people do is just work, 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 do more, do more, do more, get more, get more, get more, acquire more, acquire more, build more. There's nobody in the world that's going to tell you, <clears throat> you know, this is just being broad speaking, but there's nobody that's going to tell you they don't want to have a Ferrari. You know, somebody said, oh, you want this Ferrari? You, you want a 7,000 square foot house on the water? You want two wave runners? Uh, okay, that sounds good, right? But really, the old adage, more money, more problems? <laughs> this is what this guy's talking about right here. And this is, you know, this is written some roughly 3,000 years ago, you know? Look what he writes. The thing which hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is, is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun, right? We just find new ways to do the same things. People say, man, look at all this technology. It's so crazy. We're doing all this stuff. No, we're not. We're doing the same thing. We're just doing it in a little different manner. It's the same stuff. People go to work, they make a couple dollars, they pay the next guy, they go home, and they do the same cycle over and over and over again. He says, is there any new thing whereof it may be said, see, this is new, it hath been already of old time, which was before us. He says, there is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of the things that are to come with those that should come after. He says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Wow. He's like, I've seen everything. I mean, he's the king. What have I not seen? I've seen the whole thing. I had so much wealth. I love when he goes on to, to through all this. I could I could really you know preach on this for hours. But if you go over, um, go go to verse number uh, uh, seventeen of chapter two. I'll, I'll skip some of this because it, it's it's good. But we just don't have enough time to go through it all. He says, "Therefore I hated life." Wow, he hated life. He found, he saw how vain it is. You know, there's a guy named Jim Carrey, which I think most of us know, right? Jim Carrey is not a, he's not a believer, but you know what he says? It's really good. He says, you know what? He says, I wish all people were as wealthy and as rich as I was so they could see that it's not all it's cracked up to be. The other day, I saw a picture of uh, Mia, what's the chick's name? Mila Kunez and who's her boyfriend? Ashton Kutcher walking the trash and the recycling out to the corner of the street. And I'm like, they got to do that too, you know? They're wearing their sweatpants and they're walking their garbage out to the side of the street. You know, they don't have this lavish, lux, lu, you know, this luxe lifestyle that everybody thinks they really have. It's really not that cool. You can only buy so many watches. You can only have so many cars. And then eventually, what happens is, like Jim Carrey says, he goes, "I have it all, but I still want more." I mean, one of the wealthiest attorneys came up to me one day and said, "He he says, how you doing, man? What's going on?" I said, "It's going good. What's up with you?" He's like, "Eh, you ever feel like there's more to life?" I'm like. Yeah, all the time. And I, what, what makes you think about that? He's like, I don't know. I just got a new Bentley and blah, blah. And we were talking. I was like, man, that's really strange. So I gave him some scripture stuff. And he was like, oh, that sounds interesting. So everybody's searching. Everybody's looking for more. They're trying to gain. But really what it comes down to is there's a satisfaction of the soul in what the soul wants, what the soul requires, what the soul needs. And you can fill it and you can fill it and fill it. And it's only a temporary satisfaction. It's a temporary satisfaction. I'm going to show you how I can have the permanent satisfaction. When he says, therefore, I hated life. You know the reason why he hates life? Does anybody really like to work? I mean, honestly, do you? What would you rather do? Uh, surf? Yeah. Every day. All day? No. You don't want to surf every day. No. Three days a week. No. Come on. Right now, I'm gonna tear off all my clothes and run into the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh my goodness, where are we going with this? Look at this. He says, he goes, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, right? Because it's a lot of work. It's like it's hard and it's, it's, it's strenuous and it's a, it's a big deal. He says, because I should leave it. Or say, he goes, uh, uh, because this work that is wrought unto the sun is grievous unto me for all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. And why is it vexation of the spirit? Why is it vanity? Because look what he says. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. See what he's saying there? He's like, I can do all this stuff. I gather all these things. I get all this stuff. But you know, at the end of the day, what has to happen? Dude's got to die. And I, I gave this example of my buddy who's a Jew. And I, I, was, I was talking about Christ. And I was talking about Jesus and talking about the Bible and Moses and Abraham. And uh, we were sitting in my office right here studying for an exam. And I said, man, what do you think about, you know, when, when we get done with this, all this education, all this school, what do you think it's going to be like? He's like, oh, man, I can only imagine. You know, eight years of school is a lot. It takes a long time. You get tired. You're like, oh, I just don't want to do it anymore. And, he's, and we were in our last year and, he, and I said to him, well, what are you thinking? He's like, well, hopefully I pass the bar. I said, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. 
And I said, what's next? He goes, well, you know, after I passed the bar, man, I, I just, I just really want to get like, you know, I really want to get a good job. I want to get like a stable job, good job, good firm, good reputation. I said, yeah, what next? He goes, hopefully, you know, get, 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 get married, settle down. I said, what next? He goes, you know, have some kids, you know, get some bonuses, maybe get a couple bikes. I was like, all right, what next, man? He's like, oh, retire early, man. Get out of there by like 40, maybe 45. I said, all right, what next? Play tons of golf, play with my grandkids. I said, yeah, what next? And he's kind of like, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm probably play some more golf, you know, hang out with my grandkids. I said, yeah, what next? And he finally got what I was going to. He goes, I guess I got to F and die. That's his exact words. And I said, yeah, and what next? And he looks at me and he goes, I don't know. And I'm like, well, what do you think? What do you think happens? What happens, right? Look at uh, look over at a couple verses here. Look at the book of Timothy. And look at First uh, Timothy chapter verse 6. And look what he writes here in verse number 7. 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 7. Paul says, For we brought nothing into this world. Does a baby come into the world with, uh, you know, with a suitcase full of clothes? I'm here. I'm ready to go. Set up my room. No, what do you do for the baby? What's one of the first things you do with the baby? You prepare the baby's room, don't you? It's like, get the baby's room ready. What do you got to do? Got to get diapers and nipple shields and all kinds of crazy stuff they have now. We were just talking about that because my wife, my dog, my dog is really a bad dog. And my wife goes... The other day when Charlie got into the trash, I said, when is he going to die? And I said, yeah, I sometimes feel the same way. He doesn't, he, he gets really, uh, he gets really bad now that Noah's around because he, he, you know, we kind of neglect him a little bit now, but there's, I'll try not to make this, you know, this is going on YouTube, but anyways, there's these little shields, they're like $4 and he chewed them all up. My wife got so mad at him one time and I said, are you ready for that all over again when you have your next baby? Anyways, you buy all these things for your baby. My wife's going to be so mad I said this, but you buy all these things for your baby, you buy all this stuff and, and it's because the baby comes into the world naked, right? It comes and it ain't got nothing. It, it comes out completely naked and that's what Paul says. He goes, for we brought nothing into this world. When you're born, you come out naked. And he says, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I mean, have anybody ever seen those Puerto Rican funerals where they like bury the dudes on the motorcycles? Have you guys seen this? Have you seen that? They like, they bury the guys with motorcycles, like actually holding the motorcycle, bury them in there, put gold on them, put, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. You're like, the, the dude's not there. You ever been to a funeral? He's not there. So what are you doing? You ain't going to give him a bike. He ain't riding that thing, right? So Paul says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So the thing is, okay, well, there's a lot of depression today, Jason. You gave me a lot of bad news, you know? Sounds like, you know, all of the world is vanity. Everything's vain. There's no profit or anything. So, so what's the answer? Well, the answer is what Paul talks about. He talks about having a spiritual mindset which gives you life and peace, you know? Ultimately, what people want is they want to have acceptance. They want to have forgiveness. They want to have reconciliation. They want to have peace, right? Everybody wants stability in their lives. They want to know what's going to happen next, right? That's what everybody wants. They want to know what's going to happen next. You know, you go and get a good education so what? You know what happens next. You have options. You have a good job. You can do whatever it is. You do a 401k. You do an IRA. You do all this stuff for the purpose of what? Stability. So that what? There's nothing unexpected. And I'll tell you that there's going to be a lot of people when they die, they're going to be really unexpected with what happens. They're going to go, oh, wow, this is not exactly what I thought was going to occur. So, so what does occur upon the death of a person? Well, <clears throat> the body stays here, does it not? Yeah, you see the body. It sits there. It sits in that casket. I mean, where's, where's the person at? Does the person still exist? Yeah. There's the, the, the man is made of three person, three parts, body, soul, and spirit. The soul is you, your personality, your understanding, your intellect, your knowledge, your mind, without what? Without your body. So the soul goes into what is called departing, right? That's what Paul says. He says the soul was in, it was in departing. So where does the soul go? Well, you have two choices. Your soul can either go to what everybody calls heaven or everybody calls hell. I mean, people know these words, heaven, hell, heaven, hell. What is it? What does it mean? Well, let me give you a couple verses here and let's, let's look at this. Look at the book of, uh, of Luke and we're almost done. Give me, uh, give me like five minutes or so and we'll, we'll finish this up. Look at Luke chapter number 16. And look at verse number 19. Check this out for a second. We're 
We're going to do, do two verses here on Luke, a couple of verses, and then we'll, we'll close. Jesus Christ is talking to these guys by the name of the Pharisees. They're really, you know, super religious people. They're guys who think that they're doing everything just right, that, they, that them and God are in great harmony and great agreement. And Jesus Christ is trying to teach them, like, look, man, you're not in agreement with me because you don't even believe who I am, right? And in verse number 19, he says this. He says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores. Now, there's a big context that can be understood here, meaning from a, from a, uh, a concept of Israel and the Jews and their requirement to take care of those who were sick and needy. That was all required underneath the law. So we can show you that, but keep going. He says, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, <clears throat> moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So what does that mean? This man was taken into a place called paradise, as we'll see. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes. And in being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may, that he may dip the tip of his, his uh, finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. This is what's really interesting is that this guy in hell is saying, would you go to my father's house and and tell him not to come here, right? And he says, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now look what he says in verse number 29. Abraham saith unto him, look, they have Moses, they have the the prophets, let them hear them. He's saying, look, they have the scriptures, why won't they listen? See, what this is an example of is Jesus Christ is saying, look, even if I come back from the dead, somebody comes back from the dead, you're still not going to believe. What what God's looking for is he's looking for faith. The writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how do I have faith? How do I I know for certain that I never want to spend eternity in hell, that I want to go to heaven? Well, the gospel can be summed up in five simple words. Christ died for our sins. That's it. That's the gospel. It's that simple. Well, what do I do? You don't do anything at all. What do you mean? Well, the Bible says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. You shall have eternal life. Really? That sounds too good to be true. No, it's actually completely, it's, it's really, it is too good to be true. It's, it's true. It's, uh, that's what it is. It just sounds so crazy. It sounds so unbelievable. And that's why Jesus Christ so many times says, Verily, verily, truthfully, truthfully, I'm telling you the truth. Verily, verily, he that believeth in the Son hath everlasting life. I mean, you have it. He tells Martha, he says, he says to Martha, he says, um, he, that, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And Martha's like, well, yeah, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God. So what do we believe today in order to have eternal life? Well, let me give you a verse. Look at the book of of Romans, and we'll close with this. Romans chapter 3. If you're going to pick any book in your Bible that you want to read, I would say you should read the book of Romans. The reason why is because it's the longest book that the Apostle Paul wrote, and it is the most complex and compact understanding of doctrine, of teaching regarding the concept of what is called justification. That is your right standing with God. That's how you and God are okay. You know, people say, I was just listening, I'm gonna, people are going to get mad at me because I said this, but I had Panda or Spotify on the other day, and my buddy was like, do you like Wiz Khalifa? And I'm like, uh, I don't really know who Wiz Khalifa is. He goes, oh, listen to this one song by Wiz. And I was like, all right. So I listened to it, and it's uh, We Own the Night or something. If somebody's got to heard this song, it's the Fast and Furious song. And in there it goes, uh, you know, I am scared of dying. Only God can judge me. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Why would you say that? Only God can judge you? you know, there's, a book, there's a verse in the book of John in chapter number uh, four and five. He says, Uh, all men should honor the Son, that is Jesus Christ. If they don't honor the Son, Jesus Christ, they're not honoring God. And he says, and the reason why they need to honor the Son is because God had put Jesus Christ into that power and that position, and if they don't, it's to be understood that all judgment has been committed to the Son. So they say, oh, only God can judge you? Well, careful, because the person who's going to do that judging is actually Jesus Christ. The book of Romans is a great book, and, and the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter six, 1, verse 6, and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's the good news about Christ. He says, For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. 
believeth what? He says to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, inside that gospel, is the righteousness, is the per perfect nature of God displayed. And it's revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Read with me in Romans chapter 3, and let's just read a couple of these verses. The Apostle Paul makes it very, very clear in the first two chapters. He says, all men have committed transgressions against God, okay? People say, no, I haven't. God and I are fine. I, I, I confess my sin, whatever it is. It's like, look, here's the thing. You and God are not fine unless you're justified by Christ, okay? So how do you get justified? You have faith, you believe. The, 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 the concept of sin becomes, you know, oh, I don't like it because it's so judgmental. Make it very clear that people are judgmental all day long. We have a whole criminal justice system. We have a whole civil court in which people go to the law with each other in judgment, right? All day long. Why? Because you did something that's wrong. What's wrong? Who, who determines right and wrong? And what's really funny is when they, they base it off the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are sitting up there in the, in the courthouse, you know? It's morality. It's that right and wrong. It's instinctual. When anybody in here does something wrong, what, what happens? Your guilty conscience, right? You're like, dang, where does that come from? Why do I give a guilty conscience? You know, it's so contrary to the, bear with me for a second. It's so contrary to the evolutionary and natural uh, selection theory, a guilty conscience is. We should have outgrown that a long time ago because really if the concept is survival of the fittest, why do anything good, right? The whole purpose is to just benefit yourself, is for you to survive, your seed to procreate, you to get fed, and you to sit pretty. Everybody else, who cares? Unless they can do what? Unless they can benefit you, right? So what do most people do good for? Oh, me, Mr. Mega Corporation, I give plenty of money to the poor because I get a tax write-off, right? Oh, I go down to the, you know, do this and that. Well, why do I do that? Because I got some community service hours and I needed it for school, right? They're doing these things because it has, a, it has an ulterior motive. There's a benefit in it to do it, right? So what I want to make very clear is that the morality aspect, that guilty conscience, everybody has it. And Paul says, look, everybody knows that there's a God. You can try to deny it. You can try to say there's no God, okay? The, the, the burden of proof is on you to prove that there is not a God, okay? The things that are made, Paul says, are clearly seen. They're evidencing his eternal God and his power so that every man is without excuse. He goes on to say in, in, in Romans chapter number 2, he says, look, every single person knows that when they do wrong, that there's a judgment, when you're a little kid and you did something stupid in school and you got called to the principal's office, what were you scared about? You're scared about your parents finding out. Why? Because you'd get into trouble. And today, if you have a couple of drinks at the bar, what do you do? You drive real slow and you follow the white line. Why? Because you don't want to get in trouble because you did something wrong, right? So this whole concept of right and wrong runs out throughout our entire history. It's from, we teach it to children all throughout. But we, but we also teach our children today, unfortunately, that there is no God. We have to teach them. Paul says that they, they do not wish to retain God in their knowledge. What does that mean? They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They've got to they gotta force them out of there. That, that issue of morality, that conscious, is because you know right and wrong because it's built into you. Everybody knows it. Even the biggest atheists, Christopher Hot, uh, Hitchens and, and Christopher Dawkins and all those guys, they'll say, yeah, morality's there, it's there, but it's all taught. It's all taught. How does that work, buddy? It has to come from somewhere. There has to be a root. You can't have good without bad. You can't have bad without good. You can't say that's bad. What's bad? You say what's bad. I say that's good, right? Either way, when you do something wrong, you offend God and his righteousness. The good news is that's all been taken care of. You can have 100% peace with God, have 100% guaranteed eternal life. You have 100%, you know, I can guarantee you that if you were to die after you believe the gospel, you go to heaven without a doubt. No shadow of a doubt. I have no doubt in my mind that if I kick the bucket, my buddy, Nate, his mom might die. I mean, she is not in good shape. She's 60-something years old. He's been working with me for about four years, and his brother works for me. His mom was doing okay, had a blood caught in her leg. And today he calls me, says, we got to talk. He texts me, got to talk. I said, what's up? He goes, mom's not doing good. Dad just called me crying. I got, we got, I got to get home. And he's doing okay. His mom's a believer. He says, I know my mom will go to heaven, but you know, I, I still want to see her one last time. I said, dude, then if this is what it's going to be, you got to go, man. You got to go, go do what you got to do. You know? And we've had some people, Stephanie lost her dad, what, four years ago? Four years ago? I mean, but you have a peace about it, you know? Peace about it. I mean, I've lost, I was telling Nate today, I said, man, I think I have six friends of mine over the past, you know, whatever. 10 years that have died, all of which I, I can think of having discussions about, about and understanding that they were believers. So what, I'm, what am I talking about belief in? Look what he says in verse number, uh, uh, look at verse number 21. 
He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. So as I told you before, the law shows good and evil. It shows what, what, is, what is right. He says, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. So what you want, you want the righteousness of God. God requires absolute righteousness for entry into heaven. You cannot be sub-righteous. You cannot be partially righteous. But you can't be self-righteous either. You can't say, I did a lot of good things. Now let me into heaven, God. God says, ain't wrong answer. You need the righteousness of God. That's why he says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that look at this word, that believe, for there is no difference. He says, for all have sinned, that's they've transgressed, they committed a wrong. And he says, and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely. That is, God freely gives you everything because of what Christ did by his grace. That is something that God, grace is the best thing you could possibly ever get, right? If, if you're driving down the street and the cop goes and lasers you and you're going, you know, 82 and a 60, you're like, oh, I'm definitely getting a ticket. Cop comes up and says, eh, I'm not going to give you a ticket. What is that? That's mercy. He shows you mercy. He didn't give you a ticket. You deserved it, but you didn't get it. Now, let's say the cop comes up and he says, you know, you're going 82 and a 60, and that's a $282 fine. And you're like, yeah, it is. Well, you know what? I'm going to pay you $282. I'm not going to give you the ticket. Wow. Why would you do that? Because I just want to do that. Wow, it's very gracious of you to give me, you know, no fine and then pay me on top of it. Grace is giving you something that you don't deserve, right? As, as, the, as the old acronym goes, God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's why it says the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, right? You know, we can go through this for a long time, but I want to close with this, this one passage, Romans chapter 4 and verse number 5 and 6. Read this with me. He says, uh, verse number 4, he says, uh, Now to him that worketh, right? If you want to work, if you want to try to, you and God, try to work yourselves out and do it, it ain't going to work. You can't work it out with God. Christ had to do the work. You need to believe what Christ did. He died for your sins. That's the gospel. He says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you want to try to make God a debtor, not a good idea. You don't want to get to heaven and say, okay, God, uh, let me in because I did really good. God's going to say, no, your good is never good enough. He says, verse five, but to him that worketh not. So God says, don't do any works at all. He says, but believe, right, on him. Believe on Christ. Trust what Christ did. Have faith in what he did on the cross for you. He died for you, and he was raised again. He says, you believe on him, he justifies, he says, he justifieth the ungodly. His faith, that's your faith, is counted for righteousness. God gives you 100% righteousness. He makes you as righteous as he is. He gives you righteousness. He gives you 100% eternal life, free and clear as a gift. No strings attached, no conditions. He doesn't say, okay, I give you eternal life, but now you're on probation. If you don't do everything I tell you, you're going to hell. No, doesn't do that. He gives it to you absolutely. You want, you want, you want, to, you want to know how many people are going to go to heaven who are like, how did I get here? Well, remember when you were like 12 years old and you went to that church and, and they, they preached to you the gospel? Yeah. Or remember that time where you were 14 and, and, that, and that guy shared you the gospel at that restaurant that one time? You're like, yeah. And remember that you trusted Christ at that point in time? He's like, I do remember that. Yeah. Your whole life, you didn't know anything about it. You forgot it, right? Still justified. That's what, that's what grace, mercy, forgiveness, eternal life is. Now, does God want you to do that? No, he doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to, to live a life, and we can talk about how you live a life as being a believer. It's not a life of no more fun, trust me. It's a lot of fun. But he says his faith is counted for righteousness. That's what you need. Christ died for our sins. Paul says he was delivered for our offenses, delivered for our sins, and he's raised again for our justification. So, all right, let's close in word of prayer here. Dear God, we thank you for those who have showed up here today.